Distinguished guests, thank you for being here. What a wonderful turnout again for the 2016 Graham Clark oration. Thank you, thank you. It's so terrific to have you all here to celebrate science. My name is Natasha Mitchell. I'm from ABC Radio National. I'm delighted to be your MC again this year. This is a wonderful event and I'm especially delighted to be here tonight because we have an opportunity here over the next hour to hear one of the most influential mental health researchers and leaders. He is a neuroscientist, he is a psychiatrist, he is a major change agent in every arena he has stepped into. And he's also most recently made a very interesting move from the public sector, from academia, into the private sector. So Google has snapped this man up, uh, which will be very interesting to hear about, I think. Tonight is about science and technology and humanity and health and possibility. And so I begin by acknowledging the first scientists on this here land, the traditional owners, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to your elders, past, present and future. The hashtag, the all important hashtag, please be part of this conversation on social media. The hashtag is hash GC oration. So let it rip, please. Tonight's oration is brought to you by two fantastic institutions, the Convergence Science Network and the University of Melbourne. The Convergence Science Network right here in Melbourne is really committed to exploring what happens when you break down, when you deconstruct silos between disciplines. So for the benefit of health and medicine, they are really about bringing together the biological sciences, the life sciences, the physical sciences, engineering, data science, computer science, and seeing what happens. And of course, the bionic ear invented by Professor Graham Clark, who is here with us tonight for this oration in his name, was a prime example of convergence at work. He was an ear, nose and throat surgeon and he wanted to solve a problem. He wanted to help deaf people hear. And so the bionic ear was born through a great range of collaborations. Our other host tonight is the University of Melbourne and they've had a long and rich, fruitful partnership with Graham Clark. It is the campus on which the first, the world's first multi-channel cochlear implant was developed back in the 70s. And the university is a foundation sponsor of this oration since it began eight years ago. So thank you both for being our wonderful hosts. Without further ado, and to introduce tonight's special guest, please welcome the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research at the University of Melbourne. As many of you know, Jim is internationally recognised for his research in immunology and how genes control immunity. Please welcome Jim McCluskey to the stage. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Natasha, and welcome, everyone. Can I just um, begin by acknowledging a few very important people, and including the former governor of Victoria, David de Kretzer, uh, laureate professor emeritus of the University of Melbourne, Graham Clark himself, and his wife, Mrs. Margaret Clark, and our guest speaker, Thomas Insel, and his wife, Mrs. Deborah Insel. We also have this evening the president of the Australian Academy of Science, Andrew Holmes, and the former president, uh, Suzanne Corey, who I noticed a minute ago. And I should just acknowledge former minister, Andrew Robb, who is in the audience this evening. I'd like to also add my acknowledgement to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and the, acknowledge their elders past and present. The University of Melbourne is really delighted to be able to co-host this event. Uh, we are very proud of Graham Clark. We're very proud of the cochlear implant. Uh, this oration is a really important calendar event uh, for the university. Um, Natasha has alluded to convergence, leading me to diverge a little bit from my speech. 
um, and just tell you that this oration has been going since 2008. It acknowledges the importance of interdisciplinary research and the stellar achievement of Graham Clark and his team uh, in creating a cochlear implant. Uh, tonight's oration is part of a tradition of trying to look forwards, to look around the corner and see what's coming next. So it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, this year's orator, Tom Insel. Tom was the director of the National Institute of Mental Health from 2002 to 2015. This is part of an amazing complex of national institutes in the US in a suburb called Bethesda in the state of Maryland. Uh, I know this backwards because I lived there for four years and indeed I worked at the NIH, the National Institutes of Health that brings these institutes together. The NIMH is one of the most remarkable leaders in the world in understanding mental health and Tom was there, as I've said, for quite a long time. He had completed nearly 30 years in total at the NIH when Google snaffled him up uh, to be part of their innovation agenda. He's made a number of incredible discoveries, encouraged uh, a different way of approaching mental health, uh, looking at what is substantially biological or organic in nature and asking what can we do about that, looking at rigor and evidence in the way mental health is diagnosed and treated. Uh, and so overall, under his leadership, new research ideas have been supported uh, in an approach that has challenged traditional methods. And that's what this oration is all about. He's very well known as one of the hidden authors of uh, Barack Obama's Brain Initiative. The Brain Initiative is one of those big, bold efforts to understand uh, brain research, uh, advancing uh, innovative neurotechnologies, to try and figure out how this very complex organ works. Perhaps the last really big frontier of medical research, how does the brain work? So we are extraordinarily lucky to have a man who thinks on this scale, uh, who's been snaffled by Google, who has a distinguished record of advancing mental health, and it's my great pleasure then to invite Thomas Insel to deliver the 2016 Graham Clark Oration. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jim and uh, Natasha and University of Melbourne and the uh, Convergent Science Network as well. It's a great honor, a great pleasure to be here and to have so many people. The fact that uh, mental illness and mental health were selected this year for the oration uh, means a great deal to me. And I was just uh, delighted to have an opportunity to share some of what we've learned in, as what Jim was just saying, this most challenging of areas. Uh, I have to confess, I didn't realize what a great honor it was until I arrived here in Melbourne yesterday and have been so wonderfully uh, hosted by folks here. Um, I came with my wife and yesterday someone uh, asked her while we were getting settled, uh, my goodness, uh, what's it like to be married to such an important person? <laughs> and um, without missing a beat, she said, I, I really have no idea. Perhaps you should ask my husband. <laughs> uh, on a more serious note, I, I, I want to take you through uh, a little bit of where we are in 2016 uh, as we think about um, this whole complex of disorders that we, we associate with mental health or mental illness. In fact, I should say from the outset that the language that we're struggling with here is part of the problem. We're actually not even certain what to call this. We don't have such a problem when we talk about diabetes or heart disease or cancer. But in this area, we still struggle. Sometimes we talk about this as mental health, sometimes as mental uh, ill health, behavioral health. Uh, I tend to talk more about brain disorders or mental disorders or mental illnesses and to really focus to some extent, at least, on the people who are most disabled 
by this entire range of disorders, depression, PTSD, OCD, schizophrenia, anorexia nervosa, to a list of about 10 or 12 altogether that make up this range of illnesses, whatever we call them. Important for you to know from the outset that these are in fact very disabling and there tends to be a bit of romanticizing about these disorders much more than you would see in the realm of cancer or heart disease. But we have to be very careful about that because when one looks with a really clear lens at what causes disability, in this case a WHO analysis of the years lost to disability, it's quite striking that mental and behavioral disorders are the number one source of years lost to disability, much more so than cancer or heart disease, which may be more lethal, but often cause less disability over time. And part of the reason for that is that when you look across the lifespan, mental disorders shown here in red are the disorders of the first half of life. In fact, up until about age 45, these account for more disability than all other medical problems put together. These are really the chronic disorders of young people. And that's important to recognize because it's a very different set of issues in a very different population than those disorders like cancer, heart disease, diabetes that we tend to focus on that are really the disorders of the second half of life. In Australia alone, uh, you can see that the numbers are actually quite staggering that in the mild to moderate range were uh, somewhere north of 10% of the population. Um, and even for the more severe, we're in the 625,000 people who are uh, struggling with severe and sometimes uh, episodic illnesses. Now, it's important to know that this isn't just a source of disability or morbidity, but also mortality. Uh, suicide is a huge public health issue. The WHO recently released this report on preventing suicide, and the numbers are really staggering. 800,000 deaths per year. That's about 90 per hour somewhere in the world, with men more likely to die from suicide than women, and remarkably accounting for more than half of all violent deaths from any cause worldwide, more than war, more than homicide, more than any other source that we can point to. Most importantly is to recognize that much of this is preventable, perhaps not all, but a considerable part of the challenge could be met, and it's not happening. In the U.S., for instance, where we have pretty good numbers, they're still not great in terms of knowing the accuracy of the data, what you can see is over the last 20 years, there's really been no change overall in the rate of suicide. At the same time, we've seen enormous reductions in the mortality from heart disease, from HIV, and even from homicide and traffic fatalities have come down very considerably. But the numbers here are staggering, with nearly three times as many people dying from suicide as homicide in the US. Australia is a bit different. The numbers are lower, but still quite striking. 2,864 suicide deaths in 2014 which is still far, far too many. Now, unlike in the US, in Australia, we have seen a reduction uh, over the last four or five years, and the trends are definitely going in the right direction. You can see that here from about 15 per 100,000 in 1997 to about 12 per 100,000, which is actually up a little bit from 2013, but still, it's the right direction, and some of this has to do with some very sensible things that have happened in Australia that haven't happened in the US, such as means restriction, uh, removing guns. Guns account for about 51% of suicides in the United States. Uh, and that may be part of the rationale or part of the explanation, as well as changes in the way that suicide's talked about in the public arena. Um, we have what's called postvention, which means it's the opposite of prevention. It's making sure that when someone makes an attempt there is a whole range of interventions post the attempt to ensure that they don't make a second attempt and maybe have a greater likelihood of dying from that. But there's still much to do. We know that there's an incredible disparity here as there would be in most developed countries uh, between 
the rate of suicide in indigenous populations and those in the, in the rest of the population. In this case, you can see the numbers four times higher for youth than other youth. There are issues around how we do crisis intervention in Australia that are still quite a challenge. And in this country, as in most of Europe and the US, we still don't have great data. That is, it's very difficult to understand uh, the numbers because we're not getting the numbers we need for how many people make attempts, how many end up in services, and what services seem to be working best. I thought I'd share with you a little bit of the report from the Suicide Prevention Australia group uh, and their ability uh, to um, try to put together with um, the Hunter Institute of Mental Health some picture of what's happening. And you can see in the top graph, there is this general trend from about 1997, 98 for a reduction. The numbers keep flipping around a little bit. We have some preliminary numbers that keep being refined as more data come in. It's actually not that simple often to define what is a suicide and what's a death of unexplained origin. In some countries and in some um, provinces, a suicide requires uh, having left a note or having some clear indication, in others, not so much. So it's still a bit of a struggle. But what is, I think, most promising in Australia is if you look at the bottom graph, that at least for youth suicide, there's uh, just uh, absolute progress. I think it's, it's really unequivocal that uh, you're seeing a reduction here, much more so than in many other parts of the world. But it is important to remember and to put that into context that actually the highest rates are not within youth, but they're in men, um, especially in men over the age of 70, where the rate increases at a very strong pace. So these are things to be watching out for and it reminds us that there's still much more to do. I wanna say a little bit also about the cost of mental illness. Um, study done, now it's been about five years by the World Economic Forum, that's the group that meets in Davos uh, every year to talk about um, the sort of social entrepreneurism and, and social uh, issues. They took a look about five years ago at uh, what's happening in the world of health, especially in developing countries. And it was clear that non-communicable diseases were going to be the big driver uh, in, the, in the coming years. And they asked which of those uh, was going to be the likely to contribute the most in cost. And remarkably, um, mental illnesses came out as being more expensive, at least in their projection, than diabetes, respiratory diseases, and cancer combined. Of course, what they did uh, when they found that was to say that doesn't make sense. They'd only put in the mental illnesses as sort of as a, as a control and as a bit of an afterthought. Um, so they did another model, and then they, they did another model, and they kept coming up with the same data. And the final model actually suggested that this was going to go from a, US, a cost of uh, 2.5 trillion in US dollars to six trillion by 2030, um, which is really quite remarkable. The number actually in Australia, the most recent numbers we have here, it's about 14 billion uh, altogether if you take Commonwealth and, uh, and territories uh, put together in, in local costs. So it's a very significant cost, about 2% of GDP altogether, uh, taking into account both health and, and uh, lost productivity. No question this is an expensive area, and yet um, the spend uh, across the world doesn't really match that. If one looks at disability, as I mentioned before, you know, pushing 24, 25% of disability from all medical causes, um, in this case, this is actually looking at uh, years lost to disability uh, in the, in the uh, tallest bars. You can see it's greatest in high income countries, but across the world, whether one looks at low-income or high-income countries, it's, it's nowhere more than about 5% of spend on uh, healthcare. So it's a very tiny fraction of what we're spending in healthcare to fix a problem that's actually remarkably costly, whether one looks in, in the developing world or the developed world. So in summary, what we've got here is a very interesting challenge. It's, I think clear to everybody by now that's looked at this issue of healthcare in the 21st century that this is going to be the century of non-communicable diseases, diabetes, heart disease, maybe cancer, and certainly mental illness. But it's these brain disorders, the neurodevelopmental ones that I've been focusing on, or, or the disorders of aging, the neurodegenerative ones, that are going to be the most disabling and most, the most costly, without question, for this coming century. 
And the reason I'm here is to tell you, unfortunately, that we still don't know enough to be able to address this challenge. As Jim said, the brain is really the, the great frontier for science. And it's one of those frontiers that is actually urgent for us to begin to explore and to master so that we can begin to provide what people need who are gonna be faced either with these neurodevelopmental or neurodegenerative issues. Now, the good news for us is that there are really what I call three revolutions, uh, and we'll t I'll take you through each of these rather quickly, but in neuroscience, genomics, and technology, we're beginning to see changes and in insights and in tools that offer extraordinary promise. And I'm all about trying to manage expectations here, because I don't want there to be much hype around this. But I do think you need to understand that there's considerable hope from each of these three sectors. And what I'd like to do over the next few minutes is to take you through each of them. We'll start with genomics and then work through neuroscience and finally technology, just to give you a very quick feel of what this is beginning to look like and what this may begin to offer us. What I mean by a revolution in genomics gets summarized in this table. And I I think you just need to see this because often people don't understand exactly what's happening in the, in the realm of genomics, that we, can, uh, that we can go through the DNA that each of us has and we can sequence this faster, better, and cheaper than was imaginable 10 years ago. Imagine that to go from $22 million for a human genome down to about $1,000 today. What took uh, two years, just 10 years ago, we can now do easily in the course of a day. Perhaps most importantly, though, is this sort of social change or a change in the, in the culture of science, which is that because the genome has so much variation in it, to find a signal amongst all of that noise, people needed to come together to get large collections of DNA. And they've done that splendidly in psychiatry, with people coming together from over 80 countries, over now 350 or so investigators to create a stockpile of nearly a million DNA samples that we can begin to use to uh, understand where the variation is that matters for psychiatric illness. And that has begun to work. You can see this from about 2008 on as these collections of DNA and as the ability to do the sequencing and to um, understand genomic variation grew very rapidly we were suddenly able to get this whole windfall of new findings of genes associated with specific disorders, and those would include SCZ, which is schizophrenia, BD, bipolar di uh, disorder. Uh, SYN is syndromic autism, which is the form of autism that's really the classic form, or autism spectrum disorder, ASD, ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity, and MDD, major depressive disorder. And every one of those now has replicated interesting findings. But what makes this really interesting and really complicated is the kind of maps you see when you begin to put all this together. Because there's several surprises we wouldn't have expected. One of which is that the genes that you find for one disorder are likely to show up in another disorder. The other is that the genes aren't random. Actually, they seem to congregate into particular pathways that look like they might be meaningful for understanding the fundamental biology of these disorders, but it's not the biology that we expected. Most of the medications that people have been using for these disorders involve the monoamines like dopamine and serotonin, and yet none of those genes have emerged as being associated with any of these disorders. So those pathways may be important for the medications, but they don't seem to be very important for the fundamental biology of the disorders, at least as far as we can tell at this point. It's still early days and there's much more to learn. But what we are seeing is this rather fascinating set of pathways related to inflammation, pathways related to neuronal development, pathways related to, uh, to signaling and, and chromatin remodeling, areas of biology which we had no reason to expect going into this were going to be important for the biology of schizophrenia or ADHD. So I think where we are at this point, just to quickly summarize which of what is a vast and interesting and entirely surprising area of science, is that we can say that this is beginning to give us a first glimpse of the 
of the biology of risk. I don't think that genetics is telling us that much about the cause of these disorders. It's not that kind of genetics. It's actually the genetics of complexity. In some way, the genetics of schizophrenia looks like the genetics of height. There are hundreds of genes that are likely to be contributing, and probably each one of them contributes only a very small fraction of risk. So they're not going to be that useful as a diagnostic tool, but they may be very useful for understanding what we mean by the risk architecture for any of these disease diseases. And what is already, I think, entirely clear is that nature never read the diagnostic manual because, as I've just shown you, the, the genes don't follow the diagnostic categories that we know about. They seem to be, if, if anything, genes that put you at risk for a mental disorder, but not for a mental disorder in particular, as far as we can tell. Let's talk about the neuroscience revolution, which in some ways is just as stunning and is happening just as quickly. Here, too, we have this ability to look at changes over the last decade, and they are, in fact, almost as impressive. So fMRI stands for functional magnetic resonance imaging. It's the way that we can now begin to look at brain function in a non-invasive way and in, in living, breathing, thinking, act, uh, active humans. And you can see that just over the last decade, our ability to scan, the quality of scans has gone up because we've now got higher resolution magnets um, as measured by Tesla. We have ways of doing this that are much faster and less expensive. Resting state is a way of looking at brains without having to give people a task, which is often very hard to generalize. But importantly, just as I mentioned for genomics, it's the culture of science here that's probably had the greatest impact. The ability of people now to bring findings together from many different laboratories and to create big data sets, and this is a really big data project at this point, to try to understand the biology of brain function, but also to begin to look for the circuits that might be involved with mental disorders. It's also being able to use new kinds of analytics uh, and to get beyond sort of simple group comparisons that really matters. For the first time, we're beginning to say it's not just that there's a blob in the brain that might be correlated with a particular cognitive process or a particular diagnosis, but we've begun to ask questions that are more causal and to understand, based on manipulating brain circuitry, how the brain actually may be linking brain and mind and how circuits seem to subserve very specific functions. To be completely honest about this, this is also entirely uh, a, a science in its infancy. There's much more to do. We're actually much further along in our studies of the cellular architecture of the brain than we are in the being able to look at the human brain and as it's all put together. And I, I just couldn't avoid sharing some of the best images we have of this. Uh, a process called Brainbow, which makes use of our ability to have multiple fluorescent molecules developed by Jeff Lichtman and Josh Sainz at Harvard is a spectacular way for the first time to look at individual cells in a way that we really couldn't imagine just a few years ago. So we can follow the processes of single cells. And if nothing else, this has given us some of the very best screensavers on the planet. It's really remarkable. These are such beautiful images that Josh and Jeff have put together. Perhaps even more exciting in the last two or three years is the uh, advent of a, of a technique called clarity. So on the left is a picture of a mouse brain, and it uh, overlays a famous quote from Ramoni Cajal, who's the father of neuroanatomy. Um, and in the middle is the same brain after it's gone through the clarity procedure, which essentially removes all the fat from the brain. It's the fat that keeps you from being able to see through it. And on the right, and that green image is the same brain, but now under a fluorescent light. So you can see that it's actually still there, uh, but uh, it's absolutely transparent. And what this means is that instead of having to take a brain out and section it into thousands of uh, slices that are put on microscope slides so that you can look at them one by one, we're now able to keep the brain intact and to do neuroanatomy in a whole brain with a variety of labels. In this case, these are um, fluorescent labels for one particular molecule that hits many of the cells. It allows you to fly through in this spectacular way 
So you can actually see the relationships of distant brain areas and begin to see how cells are arrayed in a way that gives you that first sense of what we call the connectome, how different areas of the brain are actually linked together and what those processes must be like uh, through development. Um, now, th there's one sort of unfortunate negative to this spectacular and beautiful process called clarity, and that is you do have to take the brain out, and you have to take the fat out of the brain to be able to do this. So it's not really very useful as a diagnostic procedure. <laughs> there's another problem with this, is that it's just anatomy. So it's looking at a static process, and what we really want is to understand how the brain is working at the speed of thought. And that's a much harder problem. But the work I just showed you, which is coming from Stanford University, from Carl Dyseroth's lab, um, is sitting just adjacent to another laboratory run by Mark Schnitzer. Actually, it's amazing that Carl and Mark were uh, roommates in college some 20 years ago. They weren't friends, by the way, but they were in the same dormitory at Harvard College. Ended up 20 years later as neuroscientists down the hall from each other at Stanford. Uh, and Mark was interested in a different problem. He wasn't so interested in the structure of the brain. He was interested in how brain cells fire and how you link brain and behavior. So he created a microscope that you could actually put into the living brain. It's a micro microscope. He calls it a laser microendoscope. It's about the size of a hair. And you can slip it down into the brain and look at any particular area. You may remember that the Nobel Prize last year was given for the discovery of um, place cells, of, of the navigation system in the brain. So what Mark has done here is he's put a mouse, which you see in the middle, in a, an eight-armed maze. It's a mouse running around in the maze. And he's got his microendoscope going into that navigation area of the brain. And he has the cells having been genetically treated so that they light up when their cells are activated. And that's what you're seeing on the right. And the question he's asking is a very simple question. He's saying, if you didn't know where the mouse was and you were just looking at the firing in this GPS system that's sitting in the hippocampus of the mouse, could you decode it? Could you figure out from the firing pattern which arm of the maze the mouse is on? So this is trying to break the neural code and for the first time actually get us to the point of understanding how the brain works at the speed of thought. We're not there. I think we're at a point where we can know which arm it's at, but we don't know if it's at the front or the back of the arm. We have more work to do and we have to have more cells and better data. But I wanted to give you a sense of where the field is going. It's really spectacular if you're a mouse. We can do an amazing amount for you and understanding how your brain works. It's a little harder in the human brain because for one thing, we don't have the microendoscope to put into your brain yet. It's an invasive procedure, difficult to do, and you'd have to genetically engineer the human brain to be able to light up when the cells fire. So what we're left with is these non-invasive procedures, which aren't bad. And the way that it's evolving today is through uh, what we call multimodal imaging. So it's using techniques that get at structure and function and uh, temporal connectivity and a whole range of other approaches to try to get a composite sense of how the human brain works. There's a project that's called the Human Connectome. And once again, it's one of those projects that involves an enormous cultural change in science. It's not just the convergence of, of engineers and biologists together, but here making all of the data public. So this is available to anyone, anywhere. It's 1,200 people who have been scanned uh, with all of these different procedures in a state-of-the-art way. And the data include a huge amount of cognitive testing, behavioral information, all kinds of other information that will form, like the Human Genome Project, a kind of reference atlas for the human connectome, for how the brain is wired, how the brain is wired even in a functional sense, and being able to look at not just that as what's the human brain look like, but how do we all differ? What is individuality? And what, how does it play out in terms of brain structure? Very much the question we were asking for the human genome. Much more to say there. It's a very much a work in progress, but what an exciting time as we begin to have this great public database 
uh, which has just become on just come online. I think actually it's just the first 900. There'll be 1,200 probably by the uh, the end of of the month or the end of next month. But um, what we still need to do now is to do the same kind of an approach for people with mental disorders, people with neurological disorders, and to begin to put together what is the reference atlas, what are the circuits that will be involved. I think where we can already begin to feel some comfort is that we have the ability to think of these now as brain disorders. But when I say brain disorders, I don't mean this in the sense of Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's where there's large amounts of dead tissue. What we're really talking here is about brain circuits. And it's almost better to think of these almost as arrhythmias, where there's circuits that are firing in a way that seem to be uncontrolled. And where individual differences really matter. The other thing that I think people often don't understand, because often when we talk about mental disorders as brain disorders, there's a sense that this is deterministic and very biological and it feels sort of hopeless. But in fact, um, one of the most exciting aspects of this entire endeavor is to show how learning and psychotherapy and personal growth are associated with changes in brain function. And so that you can actually begin to understand through the enormous plasticity of these circuits and of the brain and the connectome that we have, that there's actually tremendous hope for um, personal change and personal growth. Now, I was, I've been talking about uh, genomics and neuroimaging uh, for many, many years, and it wasn't that long ago I was at a meeting of, uh, with parents uh, who had kids struggling with mental illness, and I was giving them this similar kind of story and telling them how much hope there was for the science that was going to give us these new insights into mental illness. And someone at the back of the room got up at the end and said, you know, our house is on fire and you're telling us about the chemistry of the paint. It's not helpful. And I took that to heart because I think that's actually an incredibly important insight that genomics and neuroscience are extraordinarily promising. But they are just that, they're promising. And it's still years of great science that will be necessary to give us the kinds of uh, new diagnostics and new therapies that we want. The reality is actually pretty bad. This is a report that came out at the end of 2014 here in Australia on the, the National Review of Mental Health Programs and Services. And it called for a real overhaul of the Australian system based on data that, that were collected that demonstrated some pretty serious problems. And I say this because um, as bad as this report was for the state of uh, care here, it's actually much, much better than the state of care in the United States. So I actually, I come here partly because I want to learn for from my Australian colleagues about how you've done this and how you've been able to um, sort of get further ahead on so many of these very complicated problems than what we've been able to do in the States. But I'll share with you a little bit of the insights from this report, and it wouldn't be any different if I were to give you much of the same story, just a little bit worse in the States. A few issues. One is the lack of access. Essentially, it breaks down like this for every 10 people with serious mental illness, only about 40%, something less than half are getting services. And of those, about, again, 40% would get what we would call minimally acceptable care. And of those, about a third will recover, two thirds don't. It's much better when you get optimal care, but this is the state of care, especially in the US. It's a little bit better in Australia, not much. Fragmentation was a big issue in the report as well. That's much worse in the US, but even here, more than in the rest of medicine, we have this odd sort of siloed effect of psychological care given by one sector, medical care by another, social support someplace else with different ways of reimbursement, and then family support, which is often left out in the cold. This is a wonderful uh, expression in this report that I really like, which I will take back to the States, called the missing middle that we don't have what we need here to pull all of this together in a coherent fashion. Enormous problems with the delay in care. 
a disorder like major depressive disorder, these again are data from lots of different sites, but median latency from onset of what is often a deadly illness to getting care of six to eight years, which is extraordinary. But perhaps even more amazing is what you see with an illness like schizophrenia. It's an illness that comes on usually in late adolescence between 15 and 25. As you can see, it's um, an illness that has a long prodrome to it. That is, there's a long period, usually about three years, of reduced psychosocial functioning before you see the onset of psychosis. Now, this is a case in which virtually all of our efforts have been focused on a late stage, sometimes we call this stage four of the disorder, when there's already um, a sort of chronic loss of functioning and when you've had this multiple psychotic episodes, where we really want to be, of course, is way up front. And that delay is costly because that delay means we don't get the same level of recovery that we would like to get. It's nothing unique to schizophrenia here. I'd say the same thing for pancreatic cancer. I'd say the same thing for diabetes. But here we're talking about young people who don't get to finish school, don't get to uh, find a career, don't begin to really engage in social functioning. Remarkably, in the US right now, the duration of untreated psychosis, which is unbelievable, this is just egregious, something like 74 weeks, something that it's hard to believe that that's more than two or three weeks, but that's because of the really poor quality of care. And in fact, that's the final issue that was in this report and one that um, has been highlighted in the states as well, that it's not just about access, because when people can get access, often they're getting care that is at best minimally adequate and often not even that. It's not evidence-based. This is an area of healthcare which is often not within the healthcare system. And many of the people who are providing mental health care have no medical training and actually have almost no training in anything that's a scientifically based treatment. As the report says, and I think this is really damning, treatment depends on the provider's preference and not the consumer's needs. We would never allow that to happen for breast cancer. We would never allow that to happen for diabetes, and that's a very much the state of care here. So we've got disorders with early onset, high morbidity, high mortality, very high costs, and amazingly, and this is the part that's so hard for people to understand often, these are disorders for which we have pretty good treatments. We can do much, much better for someone with depression or schizophrenia than we can for someone with dementia today. We actually have, for most people, treatments that work, and yet, as I've shown you, fewer than 50% of people are getting the care that they need. And the reason, as I've just pointed out, is access, fragmentation, delay, and poor quality, and of course, stigma. That is, not just the stigma of having one of these disorders, but even the stigma of getting care, because the field itself is so stigmatized. So that brings me to the third revolution, because I think this is really where we can do something quickly, potentially effectively, and actually maybe inexpensively. And that's this technology revolution. Now it's interesting to be having this conversation here for the Graham Clark lecture, because the bionic ear is like the perfect prototype of what we're interested in here. That's the idea of this convergence of science and this new convergence report from MIT is a beautiful example of the very conversation that's happening here in Melbourne with a um, convergence science network. The idea that these are tough problems and tough problems often require new tools as well as new concepts and for that you need engineering, you need biology, you need data science, you need material science, you need a whole array of skill sets that need to come together. A great example of that is not only the bionic ear, but the first prototype from our company, Verily, which is this new spin-off of, uh, of Google. This is a contact lens, and on this lens is, uh, you can see three things, those three little boxes there. One is an, a glucose meter, a glucose monitor. One is a Bluetooth transmitter, and one's a battery. All miniaturized so they could fit on the lens. 
The idea is actually very simple. You have continuous glucose sensing if you're a diabetic. That sends an, um, the glucose level to your smartphone, and your smartphone in turn controls your insulin pump. It's a closed loop. And the idea here is that without requiring you to do anything except turn on your phone and put in your contacts, you're going to have very good control of your diabetes. Now, this is still a work in progress. It's not on the market. But it's the prototype of what we'd like to do through convergence by bringing biology and engineering together. I couldn't resist showing you some examples of, and these are, again, not Verily products, but from other companies, of where we are just with smartphones alone, that the new EKG is a smartphone. The ability to look in the tympanic membrane by just putting uh, an otoscope uh, on to a smartphone and then getting the image, tapping the photograph of that and sending it to your primary care doc to find out if you're six-year-old has otitis media or not. And even the breathalyzer. Who knew that you could measure chemicals from breath, like alcohol, uh, through a smartphone? So this is a really interesting technology because there are now two billion smartphones in the world. And the opportunity now to be able to have a global impact by creating tools um, that can be embedded as apps. Will this work for mental health? Well, possibly. Just one example, and there are many, many of them out there now, is uh, a tool that was developed for people with schizophrenia, uh, in this case, providing a whole range of online services from motivational statements to coaching to actually creating a social network so people can connect and to be able to have passive sensing so that both their caretakers, their families, and their friends, and themselves, most of all, will know how they're doing. The hope here is that by being continuous, by being passive, by being objective, we can get great information that helps people to manage their illness much better. In fact, this is really the essence of what technology offers us. It takes a field that up until now has been relying entirely on subjective assessments of behavior in terms like thought disorder that don't really have anything except my sense of how you sound to me when I interview you, and turning that into an objective science by measuring behavior in a highly precise way. And we can do that on a phone. We can look at sleep, we can look at activity, we can look at geolocation, we can look at speech and voice, we can capture social networks. On the one hand, that's sort of creepy, isn't it? the fact that we're collecting all this information, somebody can collect this information. On the other hand, that's already on your phones now. You don't know it or you don't use it. What if it were made available to you in a way that for somebody who's depressed and on a medication would allow them to know the first signs of relapse? For somebody who's pregnant and at risk for postpartum depression would help them to recognize when they should seek assistance and maybe get that online long before they get to the point where they're not functioning. But most importantly, the idea that you could have a technology that would actually address every one of those issues that have been barriers to improved care in mental, for mental illnesses, access fragmentation, the delay, poor quality of care, the problems with the workforce, and stigma. Every one of these we can begin to tackle, maybe. Again, work in progress, not clear how well this will work, but how could you not try? How could you not want to see how far we can take this? Just an example. I talked about suicide at the beginning. 800,000, actually 804,000 lives lost every year. It's about 90 every hour. Now. What I didn't mention to you is that there are many, many more attempts. There are about 20 attempts for every suicide death. One in five of those deaths was somebody who made an attempt in the previous year. Imagine that. One in five was sitting there in an emergency room, possibly hospitalized, had told you 
that they were trying to end their lives, and yet in 50% of cases there was no follow-up. So here's the question. Is there a way to use technology to close that gap, to improve the access, improve the, reduce the delay in care, and make sure that you're available just in time? So just as a thought experiment, imagine for every person who makes an attempt and they're seen in an emergency department or in the hospital, that you have them consent to monitor their own behavior, look at their sleep, look at their activity, look at when they're becoming socially isolated, and you allow them to also get access to services as needed, potentially for crisis intervention. One of the great things about technology is it doesn't matter you don't have to wait until next Thursday at 10 o'clock to see somebody. There's somebody available for you at two in the morning when you're most desperate. So it's just in time care. Will this reduce the rate? Will it be useful for postvention and prevention? I don't know that, but it just seems like this is an experiment worth trying. And if it does work, the ability to go global on this is spectacular because again, with two billion phones, there are a lot of people that can be reached that will never get any other form of mental health care. So here's the model. You have the ability to use technology to do what we call digital phenotyping, understanding somebody's behavior at a very high resolution, objectively, continually, passively. You're able at the same time, on the same device, to provide a whole realm of interventions, some of which are psychotherapies that are evidence-based and heavily researched like cognitive behavior therapy. Some are coaching, some are just peer support and being part of a network of people. Some will give you that just-in-time intervention at the moment when you need it. In addition, this is an opportunity to get past that fragmentation of care and also the problem of poor, poor quality because it allows us to standardize interventions and to pull people together, whether it's a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a social worker, or someone who's providing occupational support or educational assistance. Again, here the importance is getting this done, collecting the data, and learning from it so that you're always iterating. So as you do the interventions, you're following somebody's behavior, and you know what's working, you know what isn't working. The same way that we would do that with the contact lens and the glucose meter and the insulin pump, it's the closed loop all over again. And it's our attempt to find a way to get better outcomes. We can't continue to live with 90 deaths every hour from this group of illnesses. I get it that there are concerns around privacy. There's a creepy factor around surveillance. People don't like that. So this has to be done in a way that ensures trust. So the way I would see this is that you've got to have sort of two parts of the story. One of them is showing that the technology does, in fact, provide value. It's effective. And that has to be demonstrated. We have to show that it does, in fact, save lives. Equally important is to do this in a way that gives people control. And it doesn't actually provoke concerns about privacy. It increases that sense of trust because what you're doing is providing information that people want and providing information that people can use to make decisions about their own lives. There's a wonderful book uh, that came out recently from Eric Topol called The Patient Will See You Now. And I think it captures this change in the culture of medicine that comes about when you begin to use technology to give people information, whether that's information about their diabetes or information about their depression. It gives them that opportunity to be able to make decisions that really matter. So these are the three revolutions I wanted to tell you about. I actually have come to think that maybe this technology and information science revolution is the one that will have the greatest impact the soonest. I'm not sure that it's going to put the fire out, but I think it's got the promise of doing something like that. And what it can begin to do is to scale very quickly. It gets past some of these issues that we've been concerned around, access, 
delay, quality of care, workforce, all of those issues. But I want to be very clear with you. This is a tough, tough, tough problem. In some ways, actually much more difficult than diabetes and heart disease and cancer. And it's partly because for many people with a serious mental illness, they don't think they are sick. And they make decisions because of the nature of the illness that are not in their best interest. This is really tough stuff. When you're depressed, you're hopeless, you're helpless. In the first studies of trying to use smartphones to help people monitor their depression, what did we discover? We discovered they don't charge their phones. They just don't care. They don't get out of bed. It's very difficult to engage people with these disorders. And it's going to take a lot of heavy lifting and a lot of very creative designing to be able to do this in the way that could have the greatest impact. It's also important to realize that the stigma component is tough to get around. I, I have said this many times, and I don't like the word stigma, but I can't find a better one. Maybe discrimination is a better term. I'm not sure. But what is clear to me is that almost every part of this story, the patient, the family, the provider, the treatment, the institution, all of them have a very negative valence for the public. People are, there's a, a kind of blame and shame in this area at every level. And the, for me, the great irony of this, it's almost as if every part of this story is stigmatized, except the disorders themselves, which we tend to romanticize with these ideas that there's something sort of heroic about being psychotic or heroic about being depressed. And certainly, I think it's fair to say that there's just a deep level of misunderstanding all the way through this system. Let me finish with a quote which um, I've been using for a while, but I still continue thinking about it. It's, it's interesting for someone from Google to turn to Microsoft for a quote like this, but I'll do it anyway. From Bill Gates, that we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate what will occur in the next 10. And I think that's really the case here. I think we're at the very beginning of something quite interesting. Uh, I don't know where it will go, and I don't know yet that it will, it will fulfill the promise and put out the fire that we're so concerned with. But I certainly think it's worth trying. And I invite all of you uh, to help in this endeavor and to ask the right questions to make sure we do this in a way that's thoughtful, that preserves trust, that doesn't invade privacy, that makes it clear that everything that could happen here becomes patient-centered or person-centered. It's all about empowering people and not um, doing things to them, but doing things with them and for them. Thanks very much. Thomas Insel, let's give him another round of applause. <laughs> Wonderful. Right. What a terrific and nuanced presentation this year, oration this year, wouldn't you agree? Linking all those threads together. And for me, Tom, stigma starts with this collective inability we have, I think to understand emotional literacy, to encourage emotional literacy, to understand emotional vul vulnerability and accept that it happens across the spectrum of our life. And uh, I think that's a big part of the stigma, that we somehow have to have, you know, robust minds all our lives. And that's just not realistic, is it? So, and the other thing that's exciting for me is this linking of psychotherapy and that incredibly nuanced, complex tradition of practice with the neurosciences and understanding that those sorts of behavioural interventions and conversations can change brain circuitry. I think that's where so much interesting stuff is happening. I'd like to bring to the stage now the very one and only, the inventor of the bionic ear, really the name that is at the heart of this very oration and event, Professor Graham Clark, 
Graham is, of course, Laureate Professor Emeritus at the University of Melbourne. He established the world's first cochlear implant clinic in the world. It was the first in the world at the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital. He was a surgeon in charge there for two decades. He was the founder and director of the Bionic Ear Institute for two decades. And he gives and gives and gives. And he's going to give his thanks tonight to Thomas Insull. Please welcome to the stage, Graham Clark. Natasha, Dr. and Mrs. Insull, Professor James McCloskey, Pat McGorry, Mr. Andrew Robb, and distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. One of the last great frontiers in medical science, as we've heard, is how to alleviate mental illness. Thus, we've been greatly honoured and privileged tonight that Thomas Insull, an internationally acclaimed authority on mental disorders, has shared his thoughts on new understanding of mental illness. His insights are most welcome, especially as there has not been the great improvement that we hope for in the last 50 years. His insights into how research is improving our understanding of brain function and its relationship with mental illness offers hope that we may be able to confidently deal with these debilitating illnesses. Dr. Insel's presentation is a powerful reminder of how convergent science is, to Im is able to impact on mental health by rescuing the lives of so many sufferers with profound consequences for individual well-being, personal relations and public health. Who would have thought as little as three to five years ago teams of Im imaging experts, psychiatrists, neurobiologists, computer scientists, electrical engineers and clinicians would come together to improve our diagnoses of these diseases and challenge the conventional wisdom that constitutes effective treatment. Unquestionably, we will look expectantly for the future where our new understanding of the causes and treatments of mental disability began to reduce the incidence of suicide in our communities. The contributions of Dr. Insel's long public service in mental health has been the challenge to prevent um, these illnesses. We are now the better for it. In parallel, there was a time 40 years ago when People said there was nothing we could do for profoundly deaf children and adults. However, we found that specially coded electrical stimulation of the brain with a multi-channel implant could give them meaningful hearing and spoken language. Dr. Insull has stressed that in science, it is important to challenge prevailing views particularly with new research and evidence, for this is the basis on which science and humanity progresses. On behalf of all present, I'd like to show our heartfelt appreciation, Thomas, for your brilliant oration. Please accept this memento which we have um, in appreciation for your wonderful address and for coming all this way. Um, it is a replica of the inner ear, <laughs> which we implant on a regular clinical basis, and uh, I hope will be the basis for future developments in mental illness. Um, thank you so much.
Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Let's thank Professor Clark again. And I've asked these two gentlemen to stay on the stage now because we have a very Thanks special acknowledgement to give tonight. The Graham Clark Oration team are very committed to encouraging the next generation of young scientists and, and scientific thinkers. And we have a number of them in the room tonight. We just held a, a schools event as part of the oration with Tom Insel and it was a, a lovely discussion, wasn't it actually? Really excellent questions from schools around Victoria and some of you have stayed on to be part of this oration and some of you are staying on even further for a dinner this evening. The Graham Clark Award for Science Innovation in Schools. It started last year, it was created and is made possible uh, by the Graham Clark Foundation. So thank you very much to the Foundation for supporting this initiative. Now this award acknowledges a school who is really kicking goals when it comes to teaching science, connecting kids with science, raising the profile of science in a, in a school community, not just for the students but for the teachers as well because that's vital, isn't it? Really connecting, empowering teachers to feel good about teaching science subjects in the classroom, giving them the right sorts of materials and resources and inspiration to engage their students from an early age. And I would argue it should start actively in primary school, but this is for secondary schools. And so this is about acknowledging teaching practices or partnerships or programs. Schools aren't alone here. They can pair up with universities. They can compare up with industry with experts in their fields to really create a dynamic learning environment in secondary schools. So the competition for this year's award was strong. A number of high quality applications were submitted from schools right across Victoria, which is just fantastic to see. And the short list is, let me name it, John Monash Science School in Clayton. Congratulations for being shortlisted. Our Lady of Mercy College in Heidelberg, congratulations for being shortlisted. And we also have Parkdale Secondary College in Mordialic, congratulations to you for being shortlisted. The winner is about to join us on the stage. Give all those shortlisted a big round of applause, thank you. And I'm familiar with some of the programs in all of those schools and it's a class act, so congratulations. The winner is Parkdale Secondary College in Mordialic. Come on down, have we got, yes, fabulous. Come on up. This is what Parkdale Secondary College did. They transformed their science offering uh, through something called Science, Technology and Engineering Pathway or STEP program. Now this started at, as a breakfast club. That takes some enthusiasm, doesn't it, from students and teachers alike. This was a breakfast club for a small number of students two years ago in 2014. And then it became the Parkdale STEP 2016 initiative. It happens across years 7 to 10. It's made up of six different co-curricular units including 3D modelling, anatomy, robotics, forensic science. Each is still prevented, uh, presented before school, so they're still keen beans, by a teacher, often in concert with guest speakers, experts in their relevant areas, excursions and uh, other uh, connections with other institutions as well. So that really actually makes me want to go back to high school. Congratulations, Parkdale. Well done. Congratulations. 
Look, that is where we end our proceedings. With thanks to the school, with thanks to Tom Insull for his wonderful presentation, with thanks to Professor Graham Clark, thank you. And especially thank you to the hosts of the Graham Clark Oration, the Convergence Science Network, and also the University of Melbourne. It's a wonderful partnership that they're fostering and developing to bring this event to you, and a whole lot of other initiatives as well. And please thank our sponsors. They are listed on either side of the screen. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> sponsors make events like this possible, and they make conversations like this possible. So thank you for being here tonight. Much appreciated. Enjoy your evening.